But the main story that's told by a camera on the banks is that of the working fishermen on the banks in the last stage of unassisted sail. And I want to take two approaches to uh, the images that Wallace left behind. And the first is to look at fishing itself. And the second will be how to sail a schooner. But let's deal with the first one, that is fishing. How do you get a fish out of the water, onto the deck of a vessel, and then back to market? That's a simple procedure. Now, I have to under uh, you have to understand that in Digby, 1911 to 1916, the period we're looking at, there's a relatively small fleet and their primary purpose was to go after fresh fish. That is, they went with ice in their holds, not salt. And they had to rush to the banks before the ice melted. They had to catch the fish. They had to put it in the hold in ice, and they had to get it back to market before, uh, before it spoiled, essentially. So that's the imperative under which these uh, fishermen are operating. And the ice would be drawn by oxen down from lakes uh, in the spring and put in ice houses and then aboard the vessels in Digby. They would then go to Yarmouth to pick up herring for bait. And here we have on this image, we have herring being cut for bait in uh, Yarmouth. This one's in 1912. And that's Frederick William Wallace himself cutting bait. Uh, this is an interesting image in this sense because it shows that the Wallace didn't just take photographs himself, he passed the camera around and he often appears in images often as a way to prove that he was doing all the work the other fishermen were doing. And so here you have him, it's not a particularly glamorous job, cutting bait early in the morning. And once the bait is cut, it then has to be put on trawl. And here we have another image, Jim Tidd and Judson Handspiker and the rest of the crew of the Dorothy M. Smart. Uh, this is another uh, interesting fact about Wallace, he was not just taking pictures of photographs of fishermen, he was taking photographs of particular people. Jim Tidd, Judson Handspiker, Monty Muse, these were real people, these were his friends, and he identifies them all. Here we have baiting trawl. It's long, laborious, tedious work. This trawl that's on top of the deck here, it begins as one long line 300 feet. They then take seven of those lines and bend them together, tie them together to create one long continuous 2,100 foot line. That's what you have here and it is then curled and put into a single tub. Now if we think of that one long line, 2,100 feet, every 36 inches on that line they would tie a two foot thinner line, smaller line, with a hook at the end of each one of those. That means that on this there would be 700 hooks, each one of which had to be baited for a single tub of trawl. And on this voyage each dory would carry three tubs of trawl. That means that when the dories went out they would have 6,300 feet of line and this would carry in excess of 2,000 baited hooks, all of which had to be done twice, sometimes three times a day by the two dory mates. And on this voyage on the Dorothy M. Smart in September of 1911, they were running nine dories. So the number of hooks that the schooner could put in, a wa in the water at one set was enormous. And this is the basic work of the fishermen. And the dory itself, which is based on an 18-foot keel, very sturdy, they would be lifted out of nests and over the side one at a time. So the dories would be in two nests. They're stacked like lawn chairs at the front of the, uh, of the schooner. And the top dory would be lifted over using tackle and run down the side. And then one of the dory mates, and here you can see an example, one of the dory mates would get into the, the uh, dory and his uh, companion would pass him pass him all of the equipment they've got to take and pass him the trawl while someone else holds the painter, that, the rope that holds the dory. Then the other dory mate would get in, so both would be in, and then someone would walk the dory down to the end of the stern of the vessel and tie it off. And here in this last photograph you can see one of the dories has gone off from the port side, one off from the starboard side and then they'd get the next two. 
and the next two, and the next two, until all the dories had been offloaded, each one with its uh, men aboard, walked down to the end and run off the back. And what you get is what was referred to as a flying set. And here you have being towed behind the schooner, in this case, nine dories in two lines going off to cover the fishing ground. And then at a certain moment when the captain thought they were over where he wanted them to fish, he would shout out dory away and the last one in the line would let go. And then after perhaps a certain distance, perhaps a quarter of a mile, another would go and then another and then another and then another until all nine dories were laid out over the fishing grounds and each one would put down its, its trawl. Putting down the trawl itself is an interesting uh, operation. The, um, one of the dory mates would be moving the, the dory slowly with the oars. And the other dory mate would have to get the line out of those tubs into the water. And you couldn't just lay it in because there are all those long hooks, each one baited. And they had a stick and they would have to pick it up and using the stick, heave it heave the line up or high to get it above the gunnel so that the um, hooks wouldn't stick in the in the dory and heave it over. It'd be, it'd be tremendously uh, well, tedious work to get the line set out in the water. 